Okay, today's lecture is on olfaction, or our sense of smell. And in order to smell anything, there are two things required. One, we need to have enough. We have to have enough of the molecules of that substance dissolved into our nasal passage. When there's not enough, <coughs> it won't register. So we have to have enough molecules of a substance. I used the D word here. What was that? Do you remember? Dissolved. 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 Uh huh. Dissolved. <laughs> Has to be dissolved into the. Well, we said to taste or smell anything, it's got to be dissolved uh, into something. Obviously, what we taste is dissolved into what liquid? Well, we'll go back to taste. Is in what now? In the saliva. We dissolve whatever it is that we're tasting in our saliva and we're able to discern that. What are we dissolving substances in our nasal passage into? Isn't it mucus? It is mucus. Into the mucus membranes of our nasal passages. And I'm going to harp on mucus for just a second here. Mucus gets a bad rap. Okay? It does. Uh, when you think of mucus, what do you think of? The big, fat, green blob guy on the commercial. I'm mucus and I'm moving in. Okay? All right, let's back up a step. That's not mucus. It's not. Mucus is not green. Mucus is not yellow. What is green and yellow? That's true too, yeah. Pus is green and yellow. I know that's gross. But if your mucus, if what you call mucus, what you blow out of your nose is green and yellow, that's pus, okay? That's pus as a result of an infection, uh, usually a sinus infection. Pus is basically white blood cells that have fought and died, okay? And so if you're seeing that, that means that there's an infection that's being, that's being battled. Okay? Now, sometimes pus works its way into the mucus, and that's where it becomes an issue. Uh, mucus is clear. Mucus, is, it flows very well, and it's constantly covering the surfaces of your respiratory passages and your nasal passages. Without this stuff, we would be dead eight different ways. Okay? So we really need this. Now, but when it gets a little too thick, then we need stuff like mucinex, which is guafinicin, which is the same thing as robitussin, but it's like in a different strength in a pill form, um, which basically liquefies the mucus so it moves a little bit better. That's the only goal. Mucus we need to have. And also, mucus we have to have to be able to discern things so that, um, so particles of that substance dissolve into the mucus and then that's not all though that's only half of it okay the other half of it is this we must have recept receptor proteins certainly have receptor proteins that bind to a particular substance. Okay? Without this, it doesn't matter what gets dissolved in the mucous membranes. If we don't have a protein that binds to it, it's essentially useless. Here's a good example. Carbon monoxide. Even if this room was filled with carbon monoxide, other than getting lightheaded and or passing out or throwing up, your nasal passage would have no idea what it is. Is it getting dissolved? Oh yeah, 
it's plenty dissolved in this. But we have no receptor proteins in our nasal passages that can distinguish carbon monoxide. Or natural gas. You're like, well, wait a minute. I can smell natural gas if it's leaking. You can smell it because they add fragrance to it. They add a fragrance to it that we can detect so we don't blow up and stuff. Okay? So that what you smell as natural gas is added to it so our nasal passages can detect it and know, hey, it's leaking from some place. So we have to have receptor proteins that bind to a particular substance. There are thousands of things that are in the air right now that you can't detect for one of these two reasons. There's either not enough of those molecules or we don't have proteins that bind to it specifically. Now this is the thing I have a hard time with. So much so that I had you write it down in your primer. How many smells are there? This concept is called olfactory discrimination. This word I have a hard time with, discrimination. What does it mean? When you hear discrimination, what do you think of? It means to like leave out. Yeah, sometimes it means to leave out, yeah. Like, uh, you know, a lot of times it has to do with prejudices and discriminating against th this people group or this gender or this age of people versus for this type of thing. It can mean that one of the definitions of discriminate is, is negative like that. One just one of the definitions literally just means to tell the difference between. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so what was the range? What was it the five thousand to two trillion? Yeah, it's between two thousand and trillions. That's that's a, that's a huge range. I, I don't even like writing it, but I'm amused by that. Scientists are still up for debate as far as how many smells there actually are out there based on what we can detect, what dogs can detect, what, you know, uh, what we have receptor proteins for. Potentially, there are trillions of potential molecules and compounds that exist in the earth, okay? But as far as how many can we smell, that remains a, a topic of debate. What are we actually smelling? Is it one thing? Two things? Is what we smell a combination of things? We smell coffee. It's a combination of a lot of different things that we recognize as coffee. So this is a matter of debate. Question. Couldn't you just count the number of receptor proteins? Mm. Because don't you have to have a receptor protein for every smell? Yeah. Here's, here's the trouble with that there are there are it's difficult to see proteins on the membranes of cells because they're molecules they're really really small mm -hmm. uh, I mean we might be able to estimate based on the quantity of those uh, of, of receptor proteins on a cell of the size of these cells and the number of the cells but we don't know on one cell how many different uh, how many different types of proteins can be on that cell to receive different messages? So yeah, it's still it's still kind of a it's still kind of a work in progress. So how does it work? Okay. Extending from the olfactory bulb. through the olfactory foramina and the ethmoid bone. This is the only exposed portion of your brain to the outside world. Is these projections that stick through the ethmoid bone into your nasal passage. Are a number of receptor cells. Specialized neurons that have receptor proteins on them that are trying to receive or grab a hold of um, molecules in the air. 
So extending from the olfactory bulb through the olfactory foramina in the ethmoid bone are a number of receptor cells. I'll show you a picture of it, or a cartoon thereof. It's a little oversimplified, but it does a good job of making the point. Right here. So, here's the olfactory bulb, cranial nerve number one. Here's the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone with its holes in it. And protruding in between those are these receptor cells. And they have all these extensions going into the nasal passage. <coughs> so is there something wrong with those cells when people can't smell anything? Ooh, sometimes. There's a lot of other factors in play here, and I'm about to tell you the other things that can go wrong here. Very good question. Hang on to that, that idea for just a moment. Each cell has many cilia that protrude into the mucosa of the nasal passage. Each cell has many cilia, many hair-like projections that protrude into the mucosa of the nasal passage. Mucosa is another word for mucous membrane, which, which means the membrane on the outside of the nasal passage that is exposed to the nasal passage and also the mucus that covers it. Together, those things make what's called the mucosa. Um, as we inhale, particles from the air dissolve into the mucous membrane and bind to what? Uh -huh. They are specific. These things are really specific to what fragrance. There is a receptor that binds specifically to the bark of cinnamon. And it may be more than one. That's how we can distinguish the cinnamon smell, is because that particle binds to this protein and tells us, yes, that's cinnamon. I'm bringing it back to chapter one. These proteins are chemically gated ion channels that fire an action potential to the brain over cranial nerve number one. olfactory nerve. That's basically how it works. What do you mean by the particles from the air dissolve uh -huh. in the mucous membrane? Means that <coughs> as you as you inhale <coughs> through your nasal passage, microscopic particles that that come in through the air will land on the mucus and dissolve into that mucus of your nasal passages. That's how we're able to smell stuff. And it happens super, super fast. Okay? 
Now there's some problems with this. And this is where we're going to end. Number one, the entire area for sensing smell in humans is the size of a postage stamp. And that's if it's unfolded. The entire place in our body where we sense smell is only about the size of a stamp. Okay? If you're a dog, and none of you are, but if you're a dog, they have this much area. It's about the size of a standard piece of paper. Okay? They have about that much area for absorbing smell, whereas we have like that much area for absorbing smell. One of the reasons a dog's snout is so long is because they have all of these folded areas on the inside that can all grab a hold of different smells from the air. And it's also why dogs that have bigger snouts, like bloodhounds, have a better sense of smell because they have more area to absorb that kind of stuff, whereas the dogs that have this kind of smashed in face not so much. They're still better than us, but they don't have as much as the other ones. Okay. So that's one of the problems. The second problem is this. The nasal passages are narrow. You think, well, looking at the skull, if you look through the nasal passage in the skull, you're like, man, there's, there's a lot of space in there. By the time you cover that with mucous membranes and tissues, and if those tissues become swollen or the septum is deviated, there is not a ton of room for that to pass through. I'm going to write down the last little thing here, and then I want to show you some pictures of this. And I want to warn you in advance, this picture is going to be really gross. The last problem is that smell is detected... at the very top and narrowest part of our nasal passage. Is that why you can't smell if your nose is stopped up? That's exactly why you can't smell if your nose is stopped up. Now, I'm going to warn you about the picture. This picture is from a cadaver. It is a coronal section of the skull about, uh, I'd say about three to four centimeters from the front. Like they cut the face off and we're looking into it from the back. Okay? All right, here we go. So it is this. This is what's happened here. Okay? Now, you're like, why is one of the eyes way bigger than the other one? Because they cut it at an angle. So this is like in the center of the eye. This is, this is kind of uh, further forward in the eye. This is what your nasal passage looks like on the inside. You have these giant thing called concha. Some, bo uh, some, some books call them turbinate. Uh, these huge fleshy areas here. So the air really only passes in between these gaps or spaces here. This helps with a couple of things. One is it filters the air and humidifies it and warms it on its way to the lungs. As we catch a lot of junk here, and that junk gets caught up in the mucus, it's drained down in the stomach so it doesn't enter the lungs. Um, but the problem is this, okay? These passageways are narrow even when we're healthy. Okay, so if you take your hands and put them as close together as you can, where you can feel the heat from one hand to the other like that, that's about what your nasal passages are like on the inside. Okay? Now, when you get sick, you get a cold or you have a sinus infection or allergies, here's what happens. Those tissues swell, and this is all that happens. They close together, so the air can't pass between them. 
I grew up thinking that if I couldn't breathe through my nose, it was because I just had masses of snot in there that somehow I had to clear out. Most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, it has to do with the fact that the tissues, the nasal passages that are really close together, just swelled shut. Now, there may be a small amount of pus or other things like that keeping that from happening. Here's the problem, though, gang. Some people can't smell just because of their anatomy. Some people can't smell because of a number of different factors. It could be a problem with the olfactory nerve and things like that. The term for that is anosmia, which sounds made up, but it really is how it, what it's called. Here's where we smell. This little tiny gap here, this little tiny gap here, and these little spaces in there. That's where we smell from. So a small amount of swelling there, closing those off, means that we will not be able to smell, which is why your food doesn't taste as good when you're sick because air is not getting to here to give you the full profile of what you're tasting. You can get the five tastes, but you can't get anything else beyond that. And food tastes really bland then. Okay, So you hold your nose when you try to eat something you don't like. Unless it's really bitter, it shouldn't be that bad. Okay, But here's... Here's where it's processed, is in these really, really small, narrow passageways here. Uh, my mom has uh, nasal polyps really bad. They, these polyps, these fleshy polyps, will swell in here. She only smells a couple times a year. Sometimes if people have their nose broken enough, it can deviate the septum and swell into these spaces, and they can't smell anymore as a result. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Most of the time it has to do with just air not being able to reach these areas where that smell is processed. So that's basically it, gang.